Hey everyone, I'm Alex and I'm going to try to cover everything you need to know about paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. An important subcategory of supraventricular tachycardia is that you'll need to be able to recognize and manage for step 1, step 2, and beyond. So let's get started. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to list the most common causes of paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, describe what a reentry circuit is, and how it is formed in the two most common causes of PSVT. Recognize the symptoms of PSVT. Explain the management. And identify important EKG features of PSVT. There are multiple different types of tachycardias that fall under the category of supraventricular tachycardia. As the name suggests, all supraventricular tachycardias originate above the ventricles. Specifically, they originate at or above the bundle of His. The term sinus rhythm refers to conduction that originates at the SA node, conducts across the atria, and activates the AV node. The term supraventricular tachycardia refers to any condition where the SA node is overridden by conduction in the atria, the AV node, or the bundle of His. In general, there are the SVTs that originate in the atria, and there are the SVTs that originate in or involve the AV node. Paroxysmal SVTs, or PSVTs, are a subtype of SVTs, to be considered a PSVT, the onset of the tachycardia has to be very abrupt, it often terminates abruptly as well, and the rhythm must be regular. Some common types of PSVTs are atrial tachycardia, AV nodal reentry tachycardia, AV reentry tachycardia, and junctional ectopic tachycardia. As I said, these are grouped together as PSVTs due to their sudden onset and termination and their regular rhythm. You can suddenly go into AFib but this is an irregular rhythm, irregularly irregular to be exact, so it's not considered a PSVT. The most common cause of PSVT is AV nodal reentry tachycardia, or AVNRT. This accounts for about 60% of all PSVTs. The second most common cause is AV reentry tachycardia, which accounts for about 30% of all PSVTs. Atrial tachycardia accounts for about 10%, and junctional ectopic tachycardia is pretty rare. It primarily occurs in the pediatric population. The most common cause of PSVT is AV nodal reentry tachycardia. This occurs because in the normal AV node of the heart, there is a fast conduction pathway and a slow conduction pathway. A normal sinus beat is conducted through both the fast and slow pathways, but the fast pathway beats the slow pathway to the bundle of His, so the slow pathway's signal gets terminated. However, if an ectopic beat, usually a premature atrial contraction, occurs between two normal sinus beats, and the fast pathway, which has a longer refractory period, will not be excitable. The impulse can instead be conducted down the slow pathway because the slow pathway has a shorter refractory period. The slow pathway can conduct this impulse in the normal anterograde direction to the bundle of His. Additionally, though, by the time the impulse has reached the distal end of the slow pathway, the fast pathway is excitable again, and it can receive the impulse and transmit it back in the retrograde direction up to the atria. The fast pathway can transmit this impulse to the atria, but it can also transmit the impulse back to the slow pathway, creating a re-entry circuit within the AV node. If an impulse gets trapped in this circuit, it can continuously depolarize the ventricles far too frequently, resulting in a very rapid heart rate. So the second most common cause of PSVT, AV re-entry tachycardia, requires the existence of an accessory pathway in addition to the AV node that can conduct impulses in both the anterograde direction from atria to ventricles, and the retrograde direction from ventricles to atria. So, because of this requirement, AVNRT is most commonly associated with Wolf-Parkins and White syndrome, in which a patient has an accessory pathway between the atria and ventricles called the bundle of Kent. In Wolf-Parkins and White, normal sinus heartbeats can be conducted to the ventricles down both the regular AV nodal pathway and the accessory pathway. However, a reentry cycle can be created if a beat, again often an ectopic atrial beat, is allowed to be conducted anterograde down only one pathway, usually the AV node pathway, and retrograde back up the other pathway, usually the accessory pathway. This retrograde impulse can depolarize the atria or the AV node directly and immediately re-enter the AV nodal conduction pathway down to the ventricles, creating a re-entry circuit. This often bypasses the rate slowing mechanism of the AV node. Just like with AVNRT, this circuit can cause excessively frequent ventricular depolarization and a very sudden, rapid heart rate. The symptoms of PSVT classically include palpitations. And again, remember, they're sudden onset palpitations. These often will lead to anxiety. 
Other commonly associated symptoms are lightheadedness with possible syncope, diaphoresis, shortness of breath, and chest pain. Among these symptoms, though, palpitations are the most common. Patients may say that their heart is racing, but they can feel the heartbeat really strongly in their chest. The first step in managing PSVT is the vagal maneuver. That's important. Vagal maneuvers include the valsalva, or a carotid sinus massage. Remember that the vagus nerve supplies parasympathetics to the nodes of the heart, so hopefully it makes sense that reentry circuits that depend on the AV node can be stopped by increasing vagal stimulation to the heart. The mainstay of pharmacologic management in hemodynamically stable patients is IV adenosine. That's also very high yield. If vagal maneuvers and adenosine have failed to resolve the PSVT, alternative options include non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, rapamel and diltiazem, beta blockers, and amiodarone. If the patient is unstable or if chemical cardioversion with all the aforementioned meds has failed, you move to synchronized cardioversion. I know that synchronized cardioversion versus unsynchronized cardioversion, otherwise known as defibrillation, is probably a foreign concept right now. Don't worry too much about it for step one, but you definitely will need to know about it for your clinical rotations and also for step two. So I wanted to bring it up now so that when you see it later, it's not completely unknown. Anyway, ultimately to definitively treat PSVT, you have to destroy the reentry circuit. You do this with a catheter ablation. Lastly, I just want to point out that PSVTs are narrow complex tachycardias. Always remember that a narrow QRS complex means the origin of the tachyarrhythmia is supraventricular. A wide QRS complex means the origin is below the bundle of hiss in the ventricular conducting system. A narrow QRS complex is defined as a QRS duration less than 120 milliseconds. So then a wide complex is greater than 120 milliseconds. As a refresher, each little box on the EKG paper is equal to 40 milliseconds, or 0.04 seconds. Each large box is composed of five little boxes, and is therefore equal to 200 milliseconds, or 0.2 seconds. If we do the math, 120 milliseconds equals three little boxes, and therefore a QRS complex that spans less than three little boxes is narrow. And so whenever you see that in a patient with tachycardia, think to yourself that the origin must be supraventricular. And how do you quickly identify the rate on an EKG strip? Well, recall that the simplest way is to divide 300 by the number of large boxes that there are between consecutive R waves. If this distance isn't consistent, then the rhythm is regular, and you aren't dealing with a PSVT at all. In this example, it looks that there's about 1.6 large boxes between R waves. So the rate would be in the 180s. Often, tachycardia due to AV and RT is greater than 140, but it can get up to the 280s. If the rate is this fast and the rhythm is regular, this should automatically trigger a mental image of that poor little heartbeat stuck in an endless loop. All right, now let's review everything we've talked about with the flash quiz. A patient's brought to the ED complaining of palpitations and lightheadedness. Her EKG shows neurocomplex tachycardia. While she is describing her symptoms to you, she suddenly loses consciousness. Her blood pressure is 80 over 50 and her heart rate is 160. What is the next step in management? Good job, guys. Synchronized cardioversion. Remember, if a patient is unstable, you always go right to synchronized cardioversion. This patient is hemodynamically unstable with a systolic pressure in the 80s, so starting with vagal maneuvers or adenosine or any other chemical cardioversion method would be inappropriate. All right, guys, thanks for hanging in there with me. Let's sum up this discussion. The most common causes of PSVT are AVNRT, AVRT, and atrial tachycardia. In AVNRT, a reentry circuit forms within the fast and slow conduction pathways contained within the AV node. In AVRT, a reentry circuit forms between the normal AV node conduction pathway and an accessory bypass tract. The symptoms of PSVT include palpitations and anxiety. Other symptoms are lightheadedness, syncope, diaphoresis, shortness of breath, and chest pain. Management of PSVT includes vagal maneuvers, IV adenosine, and other drugs which slow AV conduction. And if those don't work, or if the patient's unstable, you do synchronized cardioversion. Definitive management is with catheter ablation of the reentry circuit. And always remember that the EKG shows tachycardia with a narrow QRS complex. All right, guys, that's pretty much all you need to know. If you found this video helpful, then please feel free to give me a thumbs up down below. You got this, guys. Good luck.